I guarantee it, Ms. Jones, we'll have a van back on your route by tomorrow. We are working on it. It's just that it's only been a day since... No, we don't have an accident every week. <laughs> Most of our drivers, in fact, all of our drivers, are very careful. Our safety record last year was... You can feel perfectly safe riding with us. You have my personal word on it. Ms. Jones? Hello? <sighs> Yes, hello? I'm calling about an insurance policy we have with your company. I need to file a claim. Who do I talk to? Commercial, I guess, with the county transit system. Hello? This is Jane Curtis. I'm manager of the county transit system. We have a policy with you people. It's uh, Acme Insurance Policy Number CL5... Oh, <laughs> you heard. Well, bad news travels fast, doesn't it? <laughs> Well, we need to file a claim. That's why I'm calling. No, not closely. Not until recently, that is. Page seven? Wait a minute. Sevens. Here it is. You said paragraph G13. Give me a sec. Well, it reads like an insurance document. Does this have anything to do with our situation? Not covered. That's impossible. We've got to be covered. What? What'd you say? Oh, I see it. I see it. I just don't believe it. Look, I'm going to have to get back with you. Okay, then I'm calling our attorneys. Yeah. Goodbye. I'd like to talk to Ms. Morgan. Great. Hello, Billy. Jane Curtis, County Transit System. Yeah, you heard. Everybody has. Well, it's getting a little more complicated. The insurance company says we're not covered. Clause 13G or something. How, how soon can you look into this? Listen, Billy, can they do this to us? They can? We are. You're not. Well, hello there. We're glad you're watching. I'm your director for this training video. If you're a manager, a board member of a rural transit system, then this program is for you. The scene you just saw is an example of what some people might call crisis control. It's one way of dealing with the accidents and losses that any rural transit system is bound to experience. But it's not the best way. That's why we're here to show you how to take control of your system's risks before crisis comes up. Up to now, our story is focused on an accident that happened only a few hours earlier. But the conditions that contributed to the crisis have existed for quite some time. Jane, our rural transit manager, needs something better than crisis control. Jane needs to learn a different strategy. It's called risk management. Risk management is a method of protecting your system's assets and income. You start by looking for all the possible causes of accidents and losses. Once you know what can go wrong, you can either take steps to prevent the accident or you can make certain that you're prepared to bear the loss when an accident occurs. Most managers choose a combination of both. This probably sounds like plain old common sense, and it is. But risk management is more than just being careful and buying insurance. Risk management is a systematic process for assessing your system's risks and for determining the best plan for handling those risks. The risk management process includes five steps. The first step is to identify your system's risks. Later in this video, we'll take a closer look at how to create a risk profile for your system. The second step is to measure the impact of your system's risks. Ask yourself, 
how much you could lose and how often it could happen. The third step is to look at the range of strategies available to you for managing your system's risks. You'll want to consider the costs and benefits of each strategy. Then, you can weigh each strategy against the potential losses to your system. Once you've considered all the possibilities, it's time to select a plan and put it into action. You probably can't change your entire system overnight, so plan for the long haul. And in the final step, you'll want to measure your system's progress. Keep track of losses and compare them to your goals for risk reduction. If you aren't meeting your goals, you may need to look for a few more changes to improve your system's performance. That's it, your basic five-step process. We'll be going into more details in the next sections of this program. But for now, let's spend a little more time on analyzing three alternative strategies for managing risks. Here's one strategy for managing risk. It's called risk control. It's aimed at reducing the chance of an accident. This strategy could involve driver screening, driver training, preventive maintenance, and safety programs. In Unit 3, we'll look more closely at risk control. Here's another strategy risk transfer. Usually, that means taking out insurance, but this strategy includes any method of shifting the burden of financial responsibility for potential losses away from your system and on to another party. So, another example of risk transfer might be a contractual agreement containing a hold harmless clause. In Unit 4, we'll focus on commercial insurance as the most common form of risk transfer. The third strategy for managing risk is risk retention. The most common form of risk retention is the deductible on an insurance policy. The amount of the deductible is the amount of risk retained by the system. This strategy also includes the practice of self-insurance, where the transit system sets aside a formal reserve fund to cover losses. Stay tuned for Unit 5, and you'll learn more about risk retention and alternate forms of risk financing. Well, that's about it for our introduction. Now it's time for some details on how you can put risk management to work for you. If you're at a training session, the trainer will take it from here. If you're working by yourself, first take a look at your resource handbook and the self-study checklist and the training guide. Stop the tape now and restart it when you're ready to go on to Unit 2. Welcome back. We're starting Unit 2 of our program. In this unit, we're going to revisit Jane, only let's turn the calendar back and see how a risk management program could have made a difference for the county transit system. We're back in time six months now. That accident hasn't happened yet. Here's Jane on the phone with her board chairperson. I agree. I'm just as concerned about those complaints as you are. The last thing we need around here is a lawsuit. Look. At our next board meeting, let's discuss how we can improve the system's image. Yeah? Well, you know, I think I can help there. I've got something that might help us avoid close calls like the one we just had. Yeah. It's called a risk exposure questionnaire. How about if I uh, fill it out before the next meeting and then we'll talk about it? Okay. Right. See you then. Jane's about to take the first step in a risk management program. She'll use a risk exposure questionnaire to identify her system's risks. How about your system? Sure, you can anticipate everything that could cause a loss, but have you done all you can to look ahead and prevent losses? Remember what the law says about your responsibility as a transportation provider. You must make sure to operate your system with the highest degree of care. It's a legal concept that says transportation providers are expected to meet a higher standard than ordinary drivers on the highway. The law expects systems like yours to have maintenance routines and safety procedures that will ensure the safety of passengers, employees, and volunteers, and people in the community. It's important to remember this concept whenever an accident results in bodily injury or property damage. When an accident occurs, an injured person can bring a lawsuit against your transit system then it's the court's job to assign responsibility for the accident. The court may find that the transit system has been in some way negligent and that this negligence led to the accident. If so, then your system could be ordered to pay the plaintiff a very costly award. 
Here's another legal term, tort liability. It covers the type of lawsuit we've just described. Tort means a wrongful act, injury, or damage. A liability is a legal obligation or responsibility. When you start assessing the risk to your system, you need to think about all the different types of risks your system could face. Here's a list of the ones you should look into. Every transit system has a general responsibility to keep passengers safe from injury. This responsibility extends to third-party injuries and property damage, too. And don't forget liability for environmental damage resulting from accidents, spills, or improper disposal of waste. Your system also must meet its responsibilities to its workers, whether they are salaried employees or volunteer staff. Liability under this category includes claims filed by workers for injuries on the job. You also have to treat your people with fairness, or you could face claims for wrongful dismissal, discrimination, sexual harassment, or violation of privacy or civil rights laws. Whenever your system contracts with another organization, you may be taking on some risks. Such contracts might include leases, rental agreements, special service agreements, and labor contracts. Watch out for agreements that might leave you liable for negligence of another organization. The law requires directors and officers of transit system boards to exercise reasonable care and diligence in carrying out their tasks. These individuals could face liability claims if a court decides they've been negligent or wasteful in managing the system's assets or in fulfilling their official duties. Your system can suffer serious losses whenever its property is damaged or destroyed through fire, theft, collision, breakage, or a variety of natural and man-made disasters. What happens when your system can't provide normal service or you are counting on resources that are suddenly unavailable? So, how do you prepare your system to face the possibility of a serious loss? Your best defense is your own planning. When it comes to liability, you must be able to demonstrate that your system has done everything possible to prevent or minimize unsafe conditions. You have to demonstrate that you've taken the highest degree of care in operating your system. Of course, this strategy is more than a means to win in court. It's a way of staying out of court altogether and creating a positive image in the community. So, just what's involved in exercising the highest degree of care? Where does the transit manager begin? Well, we can check in with Jane and see how she gets started. Hi, Pat. Jane Curtis. I'm working on a risk exposure questionnaire for our system. Yeah, well, what I need to know from you is, do you know how many of our drivers have had CPR and first aid training? What can you tell me? So, you need to build a risk profile that identifies hazardous situations and potential liabilities within your system. Jane started with the risk exposure questionnaire. We provided one for you, too. It's in Chapter 2 of your resource handbook, of course. It's not the only tool you have for building a risk profile. Your system's insurance claims history will give you plenty of useful information about potential problem areas. The claims history should also help you measure your progress in managing risks. And you should consider other sources of information, too. You know, the bushes around here have grown up pretty high. I'm, I don't feel comfortable waiting uh, at the bus stop anymore. Could you report that to someone? Uh, yes, I will. I've, I've noticed that myself. It's, it is a dangerous place. I'll, uh, as soon as I get back to the office, I'll report it. Thank you. Okay. Have a good day. Passenger complaints can help you spot trouble before it arrives. So encourage all your employees to pass along passenger complaints and suggestions. And... Bear in mind that your employees and volunteers are in a good position to spot potential problems on the job system-wide, so encourage their suggestions and input. Don't forget a document search. Your files may contain contracts, service agreements, and leases. And don't forget to review your system manuals and standard operating procedures. If they contain outdated policies and procedures, they could cause problems and increase your exposure to risks. And most of all, don't forget that your risk profile isn't static. It changes as conditions change. Here's just a partial list of some changes that will affect your risk profile. Your risk profile will change with new services, new routes, and new staff. Road construction or roadway hazards can add risk to your normal operations. 
New developments on adjacent property might affect your service. If your system purchases new equipment or new buildings, you'll need to protect these new assets from loss or damage. Transit is a highly regulated industry, so keep an eye out for changes in laws or regulations. Also, court decisions could have a direct effect on your system's potential liabilities. And finally, every new contract brings new responsibilities and the potential for increasing liability. Not every area of potential loss carries the same degree of risk. To fully develop your risk profile, you need to classify your risks according to severity and frequency. This first category contains potential losses with low severity and low frequency. For example, your system might experience a rash of hubcap thefts every 10 years. Call these losses Type A. Next comes Type B. These losses aren't too costly in ones or twos, but they can create real headaches when they happen on a regular basis. For example, a continuing series of fender benders can drive up insurance costs and cause damage to the system's reputation. Type C risks are quite severe, but happen infrequently. For example, a head-on collision or a collapsing building. This may be the most dangerous category since these losses are hardest to anticipate. If one of these events does hit a system that's unprepared, the system's very existence could be threatened. Most transit systems could not operate when confronted with type D losses, which occur with high severity and high frequency. These conditions would cripple almost any transit system. It takes real risk management experts to operate a transit system that provides regular service in hazardous regions. That's it for part two of our program. Our rural transit manager is putting the finishing touches on her transit system's risk profile. In the next segment, we'll look at one of three strategies for managing risks. Stop the tape now and restart it when you're ready to go on to Unit 3. We're ready to start Unit 3 of our program. Remember, risk management is a five-step process. So far, we've looked at how transit managers can identify and discover risks, and how they can use a risk profile to evaluate and measure risk. Now it's time to turn to Step 3, analyzing alternative strategies for managing risks. You have three basic strategies available. Your three options are risk control, risk transfer, and risk retention. For your system, you'll probably want to use all three of these strategies. This section of our video program will focus on risk control. Let's revisit Jane, our rural transit manager. She and her staff have developed a safety program to help control risks for their transit system. Jane is presenting her safety recommendations to the board. When it comes to risk control, safety first makes perfect sense, and everyone has a role to play in a safety program. As board members, you must approve safety policies and must take the lead in promoting safety throughout the system. As system manager, it's my job to develop safety guidelines and procedures and to work with staff to see that they're implemented. I'll also oversee accident investigations and record keeping for the safety program. Now, supervisors make sure that every staff member knows the safety rules. They train and retrain employees and volunteers in safety. They conduct safety inspections of facilities, vehicles, and equipment and hold periodic safety meetings with staff. Employees and volunteers do their part by obeying the safety guidelines. They also help by reporting unsafe conditions to their supervisors. Of course, accidents must be reported immediately. Every transit system is different, so a safety program is going to have to be tailored to the specific needs of a specific system. But for any system, large or small, a safety program is going to have to include these components. Nothing I do as manager is more important than choosing employees and volunteer staff. As manager, I have to match new personnel to the requirements of the job. We're checking references and driving records thoroughly. It's part of our responsibility to exercise the highest degree of care. It's our plan to always include a safety component in the training we provide drivers, radio dispatchers, and mechanics. We won't just stop with classroom training either. Job training will continue at the job site, on the road, in the shop, or in the office. 
Staff development includes job performance reviews, disciplinary actions, and awards and recognition. We'll stick to a regular schedule for job performance reviews. For new employees, we'll conduct more frequent reviews. We must respond to safety violations with appropriate disciplinary action. This gives notice to the offending employee and it demonstrates to other employees that our system is committed to safety. You know, when we give public recognition and reward good performance, we show we care about safety. The second element of any transit system safety program is passenger safety. Effective safety programs require the cooperation of the people who use our system. We'll keep passengers aware of safety concerns. Safety is a special concern when transporting passengers with disabilities. We'll make sure our staff can recognize the special needs of passengers with disabilities, and we will train our staff to respond appropriately. It's a good idea to audit our system for accessibility to persons with disabilities. Accidents and emergencies strike without warning. Our dispatchers are already trained to alert emergency medical personnel. We're going to prepare our dispatchers to support drivers and passengers when a health or medical crisis occurs. We plan to upgrade our staff training in CPR and first aid. We'll have a crisis plan ready and we'll train our people to respond correctly in an emergency. I recommend that we have a crisis response team in place before an emergency occurs. We should work out roles and responsibilities in advance of trouble. I further recommend that we conduct annual emergency drills or full-scale exercises. Vehicle safety is the third essential element of a transit system safety program. Whenever a vehicle or any transit system equipment malfunctions, we face a potentially hazardous situation. Vehicle safety starts with smart procurement. We can research vehicle data and specify crash-worthy and fire-resistant vehicle designs. Most passenger injuries occur on board the vehicle, so we'll specify a layout that will minimize risks of injury. We're going to specify accessories like wide-angle mirrors, seat belts or airbags, wheelchair tie-downs, easy-to-use emergency exits, and similar features. It's important that we choose a vehicle that is the right size for our system's needs. We don't want to overcrowd or overload our fleet, but larger vehicles increase risk simply because they are larger, less maneuverable, and they require greater driver skills to operate safely. Our safety plan calls for vehicle inspection and preventive maintenance on a regular schedule. We're going to include volunteer-owned vehicles that may be used to transport passengers. And we plan to keep good records on vehicle maintenance. We'll also furnish drivers with inspection checklists for communicating problems to maintenance staff. We should bring our vehicles up to the highest practical safety standard. Now, I'll report to you all next month on any recommended retrofits for our current fleet. And we should install a basic safety package in every single one of our vehicles. I know it's... Quite a difference in Jane, isn't there? Now she's out front of potential problems, taking control of her system's risk exposure. Of course, a safety program is only part of the strategy we call risk control. Let's look at some other steps that managers can take to reduce risks and liabilities. Your risk profile will probably show you some key areas for your system. First, consider how well your system is protecting its property and the surrounding environment. Are you in compliance with codes and regulations covering fire, health, and pollution control? Is your physical plant in good condition, properly maintained? Have you taken steps to keep unauthorized personnel out of potentially dangerous areas? What protection do you have against fire and flood? How about protection against loss from theft or vandalism? You should also take basic precautions in another area, protecting your system's financial assets. Make sure your system's accounting practices meet generally accepted standards. Conduct regular audits. Maintain a good paper trail for tracking all funds. Insist on strict cash handling procedures. Risk control also means limiting directors and officers liability. Check your state regulations to see what immunity the law provides to your system's key officials. And to control risk, your system should enforce bylaws, keep accurate minutes, document all decisions, and avoid conflicts of interest. Make sure your board members are trained in their duties and use expert advice on complicated matters. I think you want to look into assigning someone in your staff with responsibilities for risk management. 
You can also control risk when signing contracts. Transfer risk to the other party by using contractual clauses called hold harmless agreements. Require your contractors and suppliers to carry adequate insurance. Some transit systems reduce their liability through a technique called contract layering. Using this technique, you contract out certain operations to other organizations. Therefore, these organizations are liable for the portions of services they provide. The law differs from state to state, so it is important that you get professional legal assistance when drawing up any contractual agreements and have an attorney review any contract before you sign it. And there is one more area where you can apply risk control to your system's risk profile. It's in the area of wrongful dismissal. Charges of discrimination or wrongful dismissal often lead to costly lawsuits. Every system's risk control strategy should include a careful review of its employment policies and performance evaluation procedures. As a matter of routine, you should fully document all personnel actions, and you should take steps to protect the confidentiality of employee records. Well, that's it for Unit 3 of our program. You've learned some of the essential elements of risk control. Once again, the trainer has some questions for you. If you're working alone, go to Unit 3 of the written materials. Stop the tape now and be started when you're ready for Unit 4. We'll see you then. Glad to have you back. We're ready to start part four of our program. Let's quickly review where we left off. In the last section, you learned about risk control. That's one strategy for managing risks. In this section, you're going to learn about another strategy called risk transfer. We'll focus on the most common form of risk transfer, commercial insurance. What's good about risk transfer? It lets your agency specify liabilities for possible losses and then transfer those liabilities to an outside party, usually an insurance company. With commercial insurance, your system can escape some risk and uncertainty in exchange for one very sure thing, insurance premiums. Most rural transit systems lack the financial reserves to cover possible losses out of their own resources. So for most systems, commercial insurance is a practical necessity. But you still have plenty of choices to make. It's up to you to decide how much risk you need to transfer and how much you can afford to pay. Right away, you have a choice to make. Do you call an insurance agent or a broker? An agent will represent an insurance company to you. A broker will represent your system to insurance companies. So what's the answer? Actually, you might get the service you need from an agent or from a broker. The short answer is, call an insurance professional who will give you the kind of service you want. Try to choose a professional who will stay with you over the long haul. The more they know about your system and its operations, the better they can serve you. Here's the next question. What kind of services do you need? You might want to review all your contracts and service agreements for insurance and liability implications. You'll probably want to review your existing insurance policies. A physical inspection could help you stay in compliance with regulations or earn and maintain vital certifications. And some agents and brokers can help with your risk management program, suggesting methods for reducing your risk exposure and for minimizing potential losses. It's time to look in again on our rural transit manager, Jane Curtis. Jane started a safety program at her system to help control risks. Now she's ready to look into risk transfer, so she's called in an insurance broker. Henry, thanks for coming. I know you helped us line up our vehicle insurance some time ago, but I'm afraid we have some holes in our coverage. You know, in other areas, I think we might be paying double coverage. I'd like to take a more comprehensive look at the whole insurance situation. In fact, I'm afraid we're long overdue. We need to start by looking at what you have. Then we'll see what you might need. First, the big picture. For a system like yours, there are several types of coverage to consider. Of course, there's vehicle insurance. It includes bodily injury, property damage, and liability for the operations of your buses, vans, and cars. Then there's general liability to cover liability for all activities other than vehicle operations. 
and there's workers' compensation to cover occupational injuries and disease of your personnel. You should review your coverage to see if it covers your volunteers along with your salaried workers. A policy for property insurance would cover loss or damage to property the system owns or leases. We can discuss whether you need coverage for business interruptions, temporary quarters, and a few extras. You should also think about a fidelity bond. It covers liability and losses due to embezzlement or employee dishonesty. And you can obtain director's and officer's liability coverage. It takes care of liability for mistakes or negligence on the part of management. Finally, there's professional liability coverage to take care of situations where a business offers professional advice and services to clients or outside organizations. Wow, there's a lot to think about. Just to cover us against liability, we might have to have a half dozen types of coverage. Where do we start? We look at a couple of things. What kinds of risks or losses your system might experience, and what insurance you have now, what's covered, and what's not. Well, the files are right outside, but an insurance policy can make for pretty dull reading. When I look at a liability policy, what am I looking for? Most liability policies include four types of standard provisions. To compare policy and costs and coverage, you need to look at the specific provisions of each policy. The first section is called the declarations. It identifies the policy and type of coverage, who's insured, for what period of time, the limits of the coverage, the deductibles, and the premium. The real heart of the policy is the insuring agreement. It sets forth exactly what each party is obligated to do and what kinds of expenses the insurer will pay to settle claims and defend against lawsuits. Now, Henry, what about that stuff most of us call the fine print? You're probably talking about the policy provision called exclusions. That's where you find out what's not covered. If we find gaps in your coverage, you've got several choices. You can take out a separate policy to cover what's excluded in the other policies. You can negotiate an endorsement to an existing policy to extend its coverage, or you can decide to retain the risk. When I check exclusions, is there anything special I should be looking for? Every policy is different, but you should be aware that most standard policies exclude pollution liabilities and civil rights violations, including the Americans with Disabilities Act. Don't be surprised if you find coverage gaps in those areas. Thanks for the tip. Anything else? The fourth type of policy provision is the conditions. You'd probably call that the extra fine print. It further defines the relationship between you and the insurer and outlines what happens under what circumstances. It's the section that governs premiums, adjustments, claims, procedures, rights and responsibilities, and conditions for canceling or amending the policy. Well, the files are waiting for us. Before we dive in, anything else I need? We need a good overview of your risk exposure. I'm afraid you're going to have to do some homework there. Would this help, this risk exposure questionnaire? I think it could come in handy. In fact, our board has approved a risk control program based on it. Jane, this is terrific. It gives us a big head start. Now, With the answers to our risk exposure questionnaire, Jane has assembled a lot of information that any insurer will want to see. But you should expect to provide plenty of additional details when a professional analyzes your system's insurance situation. Be prepared to provide things like official documents, an overview of the size and scope of operation, your insurance claims history, a summary of other losses and payments, an evaluation of your system's property. If you're already taking steps to control risk, be sure to furnish details. Usually, it's best to develop a continuing relationship with insurers, but if you're not happy with their prices or service, or if you're faced with cancellation or non-renewal, you might want to send your insurance business out for bid. Be sure to get advice from an insurance professional you can trust. Expect to spend up to six months bidding out and replacing your system's coverage. And when the time comes to pick an insurer, how do you know which one to choose? You want a sound business relationship that leaves you feeling comfortable. You want a reliable insurance company with a good reputation and a solid history. And you want an insurance company that's solid financially. For a detailed evaluation of an insurance company's financial stability, you can check with the rating service. Look in Chapter 4 of your resource handbook for more information. And that's just about it for this segment of our video program. It's time for you to evaluate your transit system's insurance coverage. If you're working alone, 
Go ahead and look through the written materials in Chapter 4. Stop the tape now. And we start it to begin Unit 5 when you're ready. If you're working in a group, the trainer has some additional activities planned for you. Here we go again. We've reached Unit 5 of our program. We've been looking at alternative strategies for managing risk. We're going to shift our focus to the third of our risk management strategies. It's called risk retention. Many people refer to this strategy as self-insurance. Large, well-financed organizations sometimes cover losses by paying claims from a formal self-insurance reserve or even from the operating budget. For many rural transit systems, this go-it-alone approach to self-insurance just isn't feasible. But some risk retention strategies are feasible, even for small systems with limited funds. For example, there's deductibles, where your system pays a portion of every loss. Usually, the larger the deductible, the lower the insurance premium. And there's SIR, or self-insured retention, where your system self-insures for some types of losses, but transfers risk to a commercial insurer for other types of losses. Joint or group purchase of insurance with other systems can offer more buying clout than going it alone. Sometimes this can cut premium costs. And there's pooling, where a number of systems band together to fund all or part of their risks. Let's join a board meeting of the county transit system. They're about to hear a professional insurance consultant. So that's why we've invited Henry here to go over some of the alternatives to ordinary commercial insurance coverage. Henry? Thank you, Jane. What I'd like to do is discuss a few options for you to consider. You should consider self-insurance or risk retention. The objective of any risk retention program is to save your system money in the long run. We'll begin by looking at a claims history over the past five years, comparing the amount of your losses to the amount of premiums you've been paying. If we can find areas where premiums have been consistently higher than your losses, we've got a good candidate for alternative risk financing. I'd like to know what kinds of risk a system like ours should self-insure. We'll need to do a detailed analysis, but usually the best candidates for self-insurance are risks we classify as low severity, low frequency. Costs associated with these kind of risks are usually manageable and predictable. Our risk exposure study turned up some risks that do fit the profile. Let's see, we have uh, vandalism, petty theft, minor injuries, and some types of breakage and minor property damage. Depending on your current premiums, we may also find candidates in the types of risk we classify as low severity, high frequency. A couple of examples of these types could include vehicle accidents and workers' compensation. What about the risks with high severity? Do we rule those out for self-insurance? For a system of this size, yes. You probably do. I can tell you now that you can't do without commercial insurance altogether. A truly major loss is more than your finances can handle. I've asked Henry to bring along some information on something called an insurance pool that could help us with our insurance costs. Today, let me outline a few basics for the board. Pooling is an agreement among a group of organizations to jointly fund each other's losses. They work best of all if the members are of a similar size and are in the same line of business. So for a given set of risks, your system might join a pool and contribute to the pool's trust fund. Then the pool would use the trust monies to pay your losses, less deductible. Many pools set a maximum payout and purchase commercial insurance to cover losses that go over the limit. Well, does pooling allow us to self-insure for those high severity risks that we just can't afford to tackle by ourselves? Maybe. Spreading risk over a larger financial base can be one of the advantages of a pool. As a pool member, you can also play a direct role in reducing your own insurance costs. That's because when you self-insure, you have to pay your own cost for claims administration and risk control. A pool gets the benefit of a group purchasing power when you go shopping for those services. And because pool members set the standards and call the shots, you may get better quality service from your own pool than you get from a commercial insurer. Most pool members are motivated to follow high standards of practice to hold down losses and to manage claims efficiently. 
What about the downside? There can be disadvantages. First, you can't be sure of finding an existing pool that provides the kind of coverage you want. If you do find one to join, you can end up sharing the risk with a member that's especially prone to losses. If the pool pays too many losses, members may be required to ante up more cash for the trust fund. Pools operate by averaging members' risks over the long term. You should expect pools to use financial disincentives to discourage members from dropping out. And pool members should make a long-term commitment to the group. Plan on committing staff time for full participation. And finally, there's no guarantee that premiums in a pool will be cheaper than commercial insurance. A pool with a shaky financial base is no bargain. Your system may want to look into joining an insurance pool. You'll probably need the help of your statewide association to provide management resources and to tap into the transit industry network. Expect to spend plenty of time researching and planning your pool. See your resource handbook for more suggestions on how to get started. That concludes our look at risk retention, the third of our strategies for risk management. When you consider what's best for your system, you may decide to emphasize a single strategy or you may want to use a blend of risk control, risk transfer, and risk retention. Stop the tape now and start it again when you're ready for the next unit. This is Unit 6, the final segment of our program on risk management. We're going to take just a few minutes to bring it all together. Risk management is a five-step process. Step one, identify risks. Create an inventory of all the risks your system may face. Be alert for new risk exposures as your operations evolve or as the legal and regulatory situation changes. Step two, measure potential impacts. Know your risk exposure. Estimate the possible frequency and severity of losses. Step three, analyze alternatives. Investigate the advantages and disadvantages of risk control, risk transfer, and risk retention. Step four, select the best alternatives. Once you've completed your analysis, you can select the best mix of strategies for your system. Throughout this video, we've suggested some of the pros and cons of different risk management techniques. But every transit system is different, and only you can decide what's best to meet your system's needs. But don't forget step five. Monitor your progress. Keep track of all your system's losses and track your insurance costs. Make sure your safety program is working and measure your risk management results against program goals. Be alert to changing conditions and take advantage of new opportunities. We're closing this video program with some thoughts on how to administer a risk management program for best results. You need to apply your administrative skills to make your program a success. For example, planning. Get the active support of your top management. Establish a risk management policy with specific goals and make sure they're understood at every level of the organization. Organizing. Make sure everybody knows their role in a risk management program. Leading. Risk management is people-oriented. Communicate your plan to your people. Make sure everyone understands how they share responsibility for success. Controlling. Your program only works when you monitor progress towards your risk management goals. Hold regular progress reviews and report results to the board, your employees, and your volunteers. Just take it one step at a time and you'll see how a risk management program can improve your system's bottom line. Spend some time with your handbook. It'll guide you to a terrific assortment of resources. If you need an extra copy, ask for one by calling And that's it. Risk management offers your system a great opportunity to reduce costs and improve performance. There are plenty of options to choose from. Some are bound to be right for your system. So look them over, and remember, the choice is yours. Mm -hmm.